and welcome back everyone. So today I'd like to take some time to examine a crucial passage that's almost always used as a proof text for the doctrine of hell and eternal torment. And it's one that I've seen brought up quite often in discussions, but also one about which there just seems to be a lot of confusion out there. And I'm talking about Revelation 14, 9 through 11. So let's just uh, start and go ahead and take a look at it. The passage reads, quote, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone, in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So, obviously, it's very easy to see how this one gets quoted so much as a proof text for hell and for eternal torment. These verses have everything a believer in eternal torment could ever ask for. It has all the terminology that most Christians generally associate with hell. Here we find the words wrath, fire, brimstone, torment, forever and ever. Now, it's because of this terminology and because this passage is raised so often as a proof text for eternal torment that I really want to dig into this one. And I'm going to go into a lot of detail. But for that reason, I'm going to have to break this one up into a couple of parts rather than try to get this all out in one long video. But I'm going to say right here at the beginning that I think that these verses and this passage have been completely abused and misunderstood by those who try to teach that they're about the eternal torment of the lost. I'll even go a bit further and say that I think this passage can only be made to teach eternal torment by completely ignoring its context, both its context within the book of Revelation and the context of Scripture as a whole. And I think if we can show to anyone with an open mind that once properly considered in context, the correct interpretation of this passage becomes abundantly clear, and that that interpretation has absolutely nothing to do with hell or with the eternal torment of the lost. And I think if we can show that, that this passage, one that contains all the language and imagery that people so often associate with hell, the fire, the smoke, the brimstone, the torment, if this passage fails to prove the doctrine of eternal torment, then we really need to ask ourselves what passage of scripture ever could be used as a proof text for hell. But before diving in, I have just a couple of brief caveats. First, just because I firmly believe that these verses in this passage have nothing to do with hell or with the eternal torment of the lost, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't take the warnings here seriously. Some seem to think that those, like myself, who deny that the Bible teaches the eternal torment of the lost, that somehow we believe that there's no judgment or punishment for sin. So I want to be really clear up front. The Bible never warns us where there's no danger, and the judgments threatened in this passage are very stark, and they should be taken seriously. And if anything, that should prompt us to be even more careful to make sure that we properly understand what's really going on here. And so just one more thing before we get started. This passage appears in the book of Revelation, and I think we'd all agree that the interpretation of Revelation can be tricky and controversial. So, because I know that interpretations of Revelation can vary greatly, in this video I'm going to try to avoid specifics about some of the symbolism in this passage, and rather just try and focus on the broader context in which it appears. I think it can be shown that that's really all we need to do to prove that those who use this passage as a proof text for hell are seriously mistaken. So, with those two caveats in mind, let's get started. Is Revelation 14, 9 through 11 really about hell or about the eternal torment of the unsaved? In reality, for any passage to be a true proof text 
for the doctrine of hell or for eternal torment, it needs to do three things. First, the passage must be applicable to all of the lost and unsaved in general, rather than be a warning to a specific class of people at a specific time. Specific warnings at specific times to specific people should never be used as generic descriptions of hell, as though the warning applied to everyone. To do that is really just to ignore the context of a passage. Second, in order for a passage to be a true proof text for hell, it needs to be shown that the threatening applies to a condition beyond this earthly life, time, or realm, rather than being a description of something to befall the living right here on earth in this age. After all, if the warning can be shown to be of an earthly nature, that it applies to this current age, then it can't really be about hell. And third, any proof text for hell must clearly demonstrate that it's threatening a judgment that continues for eternity. And of course this would be necessary if, as we've been told, hell is a place of eternal torment. So, can Revelation 14, 9-11 be shown to have all three of these characteristics? Well, as I hope to prove, when we really examine this passage, it'll become clear that actually it has none of these characteristics, and so could never actually be a proof text for hell. So, about that first point. Is Revelation 14, 9 through 11 a general warning about hell, or is it a warning to a specific class of people at a specific time? And the answer to this one should be obvious. This passage, as it appears in the book of Revelation, is a prophecy. There is no general warning about hell here. No, this warning, contained in Revelation 14, 9 through 11, is directed towards a very specific class of people at a very specific time. So, who's being threatened here? Verse 9 makes that clear. It states, if anyone is worshipping the beast, the beast's image, or taking the beast's mark. It's that class of people who are being threatened here. This is not a general warning for the lost or unsaved. Now, quite often, I've seen this passage quoted with that information about that specific class of people, those worshipping the beast, omitted. For example, there's a popular fundamentalist online track called The Truth About Hell. And notice here how they've quoted only part of Revelation 14.11. They only say, quote, The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Period. Do you see how they place that period after the word night? Yeah, that's the problem. There's no period there. Who exactly has no rest day nor night? according to verse 11. Verse 11 says, They have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. And as we're going to see, that information about who is being threatened here is extremely important. Whatever they're being threatened with is directed at them, not the lost or the unsaved or wicked mankind in general. So, the first thing I'd say to those who use this passage as a proof text for hell is that they have no business quoting this passage in that way, omitting the specific class of people to whom this warning is directed, unless they're also prepared to identify just who these people are who are being threatened. Can they tell us who they are? Or who or what the beast is? Can they tell us what the beast's image is or its mark? These are the only ones being threatened here. So, when it comes to our first point, that any passage to really be a proof text for hell, that it needs to be directed toward the unsaved in general rather than a specific class of people, this passage already completely fails, at least in that regard. Now, let's consider the second point that any true proof text for hell must be shown to be describing conditions beyond this age or life. And the first thing to notice here is the imagery of this warning. It says, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, 
and they shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the Lamb and in the presence of his holy angels. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Where does that imagery come from? Is that a picture of hell? Are you sure? Most believers assume that this warning is closely associated with the lake of fire we read about in Revelation chapters 19 through 21. For example, in Revelation 19:20 we read that the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he had deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshiped his image. These were both cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And then in Revelation 20.15, we read that, quote, Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, at first glance, and I emphasize at first glance, this might seem like a reasonable assumption to make, that Revelation 14.9-11 is to be associated with the lake of fire. But is that assumption correct? And I think we're going to find as we go along that there's something very different going on here. But for now, I'd like you to just consider this. Note that the first time that this lake of fire appears is at the end of Revelation chapter 19 and verse 20, where we see that the beast and the false prophet were cast into the lake of fire. But at that point, when the beast and false prophet are cast into the lake of fire, what happens to those who are worshiping the beast and the false prophet? You know, the ones who are actually being threatened in Revelation 14, 9 through 11. Well, they are simply killed at that point. We read in Revelation 19, 19 that, quote, The remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Now, nothing is said of them here being cast into the lake of fire at the same time the beast and the false prophet were cast there. And now, notice again in Revelation 20 when the lake of fire appears next. In verse 10, we read that, quote, The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they, that is, the devil, beast, and false prophet, shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, what's the context here? Well, this event occurs at the end of what many refer to as the millennium, or the 1,000 years. We can read earlier in Revelation 20 that the devil is to be bound up during this 1,000 years in order that he can't deceive the nations during that time, and that at the end of the 1,000 years he's released for a short period of time where he deceives the nations. But before the devil is cast into the lake of fire with the beast and false prophet, what happens to those who the devil deceived? Well, again, in Revelation 20 verse 9, we read that they're simply killed by fire descending out of heaven and devouring them. We read, quote, And they, that is, those the devil deceived, went up on the breadth of the earth, encompassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Do you see a pattern here? Before the beast and false prophet were cast into the lake of fire, those worshiping them were simply killed. Before the devil is cast into the lake of fire, those who followed him are simply killed. And then when we finally come to Revelation 20.15, where we read that, quote, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Well, at that point, any language about the torment of these is completely absent. The Bible never says that those who are cast into the lake of fire here are tormented day or night forever and ever. No, that phrase applies exclusively to the devil, the beast, and the false prophet. Now, all of this should seem very strange if the warning of torment contained in Revelation 14, 9 through 11, where it says that the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, is really about hell or about the lake of fire. The only ones ever said to be tormented forever and ever in the lake of fire are the devil, the beast, and the false prophet, not those who are worshiping the beast or worshiping the false prophet or those deceived by the devil. 
So that's one thing. And it's a little surprising that it never seems to have occurred to Christians that the torment of Revelation 14, 9 through 11 might be an entirely different torment than that of the lake of fire in Revelation 19 and 20. But let's dig a little deeper. I mentioned earlier that this passage needs to be considered in its wider scriptural context, and I've been really surprised by the complete failure of Christians to do that when it comes to this passage. Like much of the imagery in the book of Revelation, the imagery we find here in Revelation 14, 9 through 11 comes from the Old Testament. And here we find a direct cross reference to a passage in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 34, 8 through 10. So let's take a look at that. There we read, quote, For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. And the streams thereof shall be turned to pitch, and the dust thereof into brimstone and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched night nor day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever and ever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. Now, anyone with an open mind should be able to admit the obvious connection between this passage in Isaiah 34 and the one in Revelation 14, 9-11. It's clear that Revelation 14 has borrowed the imagery and language from this passage in Isaiah. And so, considering this language, I'd like you to ask yourself this. Say someone quoted part of that passage from Isaiah, the part that says, It shall not be quenched night nor day, the smoke thereof shall go up forever. What does that sound like to you? Well, I don't think it's a stretch to say that many Christians would think that language was talking about hell. But here's the thing. This passage from the book of Isaiah isn't about hell at all. If we consider the context and read a little further back, we find in verse 6, quote, The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness and the blood of lambs and goats with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord hath a sacrifice in Basra, and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. Now, this whole passage is talking about a judgment which was to befall the land of Edom, or Idumea, here in the King James Version. And notice, it is the land of Edom that is to burn with fire and brimstone. And in verse 9, it's the land that becomes burning pitch. And it's from the land that the smoke goes up forever. This judgment here is strictly earthly in nature, as the context makes clear. There just is no hell in this passage. So what's important to notice here is that this language and imagery, fire and brimstone, perpetually rising smoke, language that most Christians just automatically associate with hell, isn't here about hell at all. But it's precisely this imagery from which Revelation 14, 9 through 11 is taken. And we need to ask ourselves, why then should we ever assume that Revelation is speaking of something completely different, a place of eternal torment in some other place, time, or dimension? Again, the language of Isaiah is about a judgment which was to take place on this earth. Why should we think that Revelation 14, using nearly identical language, is describing anything different? So, considering this context, something that we're repeatedly told we need to do, wouldn't it be more reasonable to think that Revelation 14 is describing the same kind of earthly judgment, rather than assume that the passage is about a hell of eternal torment, something entirely foreign to the context of the book of Isaiah? So, already our second requirement for this passage to be a proof text for hell, that it needs to show that the threatening applies to a condition beyond this earthly time and realm, rather than being a description of something to befall the living right here on earth, well, that requirement is already on some pretty shaky ground. I mean, if Revelation 14, 9 through 11 is so obviously about hell, then how is it that nearly identical language and imagery in Isaiah 
can be said of conditions and judgments which are clearly not about hell at all, but take place right here on this earth. How is someone ever going to prove that language like that necessarily applies to hell? So I can tell you, we're just getting started here. I think we can absolutely know and prove that Revelation 14, 9-11 is not about hell, but is in fact talking about judgments which are to take place right here on earth. But in order to do that, I'm going to need to go into a significant amount of detail. So I'm going to leave that for part two, along with the question of whether or not Revelation 14, 9 through 11 teaches a condition for the lost, which extends throughout eternity. And I think that a lot of people may be surprised at just how simple the real meaning of Revelation 14 becomes once we remove the theological glasses we've been accustomed to wearing and just carefully consider these verses in context. But that's going to have to wait until next time. I really want to say a big thank you to everyone who's taken the time to check out these videos so far. This whole YouTube and video making process is really new to me, so I realize I might be a little slower than I'd like in getting these videos out. But I genuinely do appreciate all of you who've shown interest so far and who've taken the time to watch. It really has been encouraging to me. So that's going to wrap it up for today. Once again, I'm David with the Harvest Herald, and I hope to talk to you all again real soon in the next video.